Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. It's time for another Tree School online webinar. I'm Glenn Ahrens, OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River Counties. It's my pleasure to be your host for this afternoon's Tree School online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. Tree School Online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. There are two webinars each Tuesday, one at 10 a.m. and another at 3 p.m. Some housekeeping details. The Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see it, you can scroll up uh, over the area and you might get it to pop up. Scroll down to the bottom or up to the top if you have a iPad or some other hardware that has it at the top. Audio is muted for participants unless unmuted by the host. Uh, video is not available for participants. We want you to use written questions in the question and answer box, the Q&A box. That's the best way to ask questions of our, of our speaker. Um, ask that you use that for all your questions and not to use the chat for that. And the chat will be used if you're having technical difficulties or you want to communicate um, with us, uh, but not about the speaker content. Please use the Q&A box. And extra resources uh, provided by our speaker today would be found at the Tree School Online Class Guide. And you can click on that through the knowyourforest.org Tree School Online, uh, or you can find us directly through the extension site. And then click on the webinar description for this webinar and other webinars past in the future. Uh, and you'll find the instructor resources for each of those webinars. We are recording these webinars and we're gonna post the recording on the Tree School Online at knowyourforest.org. Um, and they'll be archived so you can watch it on YouTube. Also, as part of this, we're going to have a, a poll uh, just to get to know the audience a little bit at the beginning and also at the end to see how you like the show and if it's useful to you. And that poll should pop up um, on your screen in a box. And after you answer the questions, the poll can be closed. If you don't see the polls, uh, check your Zoom toolbar for a lighted button and maybe get it to pop up. Um, I have a brief disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by our speakers are theirs and theirs alone and not those of OSU, OFRI, or the Partnership for Forestry Education. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Neil Schroeder, and I just want to make sure I'll enable Neil's video here. Um, so Neil um, is going to be coming to us talking about goods from the woods, uh, representing the Oregon Woodland Co-op. I've known Neil for many years as uh, representing the Woodland Co-op and coming to tree school. Uh, I know he's a woodland owner in Washington County, um, but a little bit deeper into Neil's background that his father and others actually co-founded the Oregon Woodland Co-op back in 1980. And uh, Neil got involved later on in the 90s as part of the kind of the family uh, passion about woodland management. Uh, but Neil was a math teacher and also uh, helped uh, promote and sell educational materials. But after he retired from that career, he came back into the fold with the co-op, was president of the Oregon Woodland Co-op from the mid-90s the mid for a good stint there, I think mm -hmm. around nine years. Um, so now, Neil, I know him again as the, the man to talk to us about special forest products and goods from the woods. But the background to the co-op, I think, uh, Neil, you might say something about that as part of your introduction, but it's really there for woodland owners and to help woodland owners team up uh, and take care of each other and, and have a strong position um, you know, as uh, woodland family forest owners. So with that, Neil, I'll let you go ahead and start uh, your introduction and then we'll go into the poll before we really get going. So welcome, Neil, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. I'd like to go to that first screen, Glenn. What's my first step here? Oh, just go back to your PowerPoint and advance uh, to the next slide because you're in control. Okay. I guess I don't know how to start that next slide. All right. Well, uh, you should be able to just hit your cursor or, or even click through the mouse you did no, it before. Okay. Do I want to stop share? 
No, you should just on your computer on your laptop. You should be able to just advance the, uh, you know, with the the uh, arrow button. Okay. Try that. There we go. Did you get it to advance? Somehow I have not been able to get it to to advance. I don't know why. Maybe your computer is frozen from leaving it sitting. But uh, <laughs> it could be. Well, why don't I do the opening poll? And okay. if you could try to make your, your slide advance, you could go into the PowerPoint presentation and just maybe right click. Yeah, okay. And does that give you an end show? There you go, or next, there you go. There we go. But you should be okay. able to do that with the uh, cursor on your keyboard. I thought we did that before. But mm -hmm. so would you like now. to go ahead and in introduce your show and then we'll start the poll? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about goods from the woods. And the reason that we're doing this is that um, I'm past president of the Oregon Woodland Cooperative, which is an organization now of approximately 70 landowners. And collectively, we own 30,000 acres approximately of timberland within Oregon in about 15 counties now. And uh, as we've progressed over the years, we've learned that not only can we help our neighbors and our members in protecting their woodland and finding good ways to manage their land, but also how to add value to their land. And that's what we're going to do today. Talk about adding value in many ways. So go ahead, Glenn. All right, I'm gonna start the poll. And this is just to find out a bit about the audience. Many of you are familiar with this. Where are you from? Are you a woodland owner? Uh, if you own land and how many acres? Uh, just take about a minute uh, to learn more about our audience. And typically with our kind of our Willamette Valley centric uh, origins for Clackamas Tree School, we have a lot of attendees from the valley. And of course, woodland owners are our key audience. And just another few seconds and usually about 80% of folks will vote and we'll call it good. All righty, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results so we can all see that uh, indeed almost three quarters of us are from the Willamette Valley and some from coastal Oregon, uh, just a few from central or eastern Oregon, about 12% from Washington state. And woodland owners are the majority, about 62%, but also a good uh, number of uh, private and public natural resource professionals and about 15% folks that are just here out of general interest, not associated with owning or managing woodlands. As far as acreage, um, a little more than a quarter that own 10 to 40 acres, uh, about 23% own no land. And then we've got 40 to 100 acres and 100 to 1,000 acres, the other 30% uh, or so. So that's the results of the poll, Neil, so you can get to know who's out there. Yeah, wonderful. And go ahead and have you been able to advance your slide? Um, I'm Rather than advance the slide at this point, I want to tickle your imagination a little bit. And so my wife, Ardis, A-R-D-I-S, by the way, is going to show you some samples of products and ideas that come from your forest. So let's turn Ardis on. Let's see, what's the best way to do that, Glenn? Well, uh, it looks like she's on if she shows okay. her, if she starts showing things around and if you want to turn your video off. Um, okay. Yeah, I want to see what she's doing and I haven't yet. Okay, why don't you uh, stop sharing your PowerPoint and see okay. if that helps. All right, here we go. Good. All right, Artis is first showing you a bundle of firewood, and I wanted her to show the, the ends of it 
because this way, here we are a nine by nine by 16 inch bundle. If you see that one end, you get an idea of how small the wood is. And the reason I want you to see how small the wood is, is because when you thin your forest, you can start thinning at three to six inches and still sell what you're thinning. Okay, there's the bundle of firewood. And then on the back of the label is a story. We now have about 20 stories from people who have bundled and sold bundles of firewood through the Oregon Woodland Co-op. And by the way, there's a premium bundle, which is a hardwood bundle as opposed to a softwood or alder bundle. And we are selling our bundles. We, we sold about $140,000 worth of bundled firewood just this year. And it looks like it'll be more next year, probably because of COVID-19. Okay, now Artis is showing you some other things. Um, here's uh, our daughter on a, working with a super split. Go to the right, Artis, and look at that stack of firewood. This gives you an example of how much firewood we might prepare to sell in a given week. Okay, let's go on. Uh, pick up um, the next one would be um, Ben Doimling, if you would. Okay. All right, here's Ben Doimling. Ben has two or three small sawmills. And what he's doing right now is using his sawmills to cut oak and other hardwoods and he's selling flooring as a result of what he's cutting. All right, go on to anything else. Yo, oh, we're talking about truffles and I noticed that the beginning of uh, today's presentation was on truffles in Oregon. Many of our members are selling truffles and there are a lot of articles that are available and uh, if you ask Glenn, you can get a rerun of that truffle presentation this morning. There's several things I recommend that you look at. Uh, come this way a bit and, and look at those magazines. Um, the Sawmill and Woodlot magazine I subscribe to. And the reason that I recommend it is that if you have any interest at all in selling firewood or selling anything from your woods, this particular magazine does a good job of telling you how to do it. Um, several different things. Go down one more, artist, to that carving picture. Here's an article from the uh, Sawmill and Woodlot magazine. That lady that is not well seen in that picture, there she goes, is, has carved all of those columns, and those columns now are in front of a Safeway store down in San Jose. And she sold those logs and carved them and put them in front of that Safeway store for a pretty good change, piece of change. All right, go on to something else. Uh, to my right, to your right. Okay, oh, this one is take it outside. This lady is involved in what is called forest bathing. And it's just simply to go outside into the forest and learn to s s find all of the senses in the forest, the smells, the uh, temperatures, the uh, feeling of a, of a leaf, uh, all of those things. People are actually selling forest bathing tours right now. Okay, going on, here's an example of uh, essential oils. One of my partners, uh, Richard and Ann Honshu, are working with us to sell the essential oils distilled from the greenery of seven different conifers. And this gives you an idea. You can see noble fir and grand fir, ponderosa pine, uh, western red cedar, and so on. There's a picture of the still that we use to distill those oils. All right, go to the right a little further. And you see there are that bottle shows some bitters made from Douglas fir oil and sold to the bars in the area. And then there's soaps and spritzers and uh, just a whole lot of different ideas made from essential oil. Okay, come to the right a little further. Here we have some wood turnings. Uh, that pestle in the center was made from, believe it or not, rhododendron. 
And uh, on the right, you'll see uh, some chunks of wood. If you'll show those artists, yeah. Those are simply blocks of wood. You can actually dry your logs, cut them into blocks and sell them to wood turners. In fact, North Woods Figured Woods, if you look it up on your uh, website, is selling blocks of wood for wood turners and they buy their blocks of wood from landowners. So there's another option. Okay, come down toward you. That first bag is a bag of what looks like simply strings of wood. It's made from sawing a log with your chainsaw instead of crosscut, turn it 90 degrees and you get cuttings like this. Down further, some more uh, fire starters, a, a cone with uh, paraffin on the bottom, some paraffin put into an egg carton and made into wood, uh, uh, fire starters. The next thing is a, a slice of a log. People are selling slices of logs to florist shops and getting as much as $7 per slice. Um, next uh, to, my, to your right, oh yeah, that one right there, that's um, what is called a smudge stick. And it's simply a, chunk, a, a piece of, the, of incense cedar wrapped into a shape of a cigar and then put, when it dries, put it in a uh, seashell and light a match to it and you'll fill your room with this wonderful aroma of incense cedar. People will pay as much as seven dollars for a single smudge stick. Um, we put those conks out because a number of people are making, would you believe, necklaces and floral decorations simply from conks. Um, imagine how many you could find in your woods. Um, this next picture is a picture of some folks that are selling resin from pine. They have found a market for just the resin from pine. Okay, let's go on to, uh, yeah, that. Here we have a bag of charcoal. And that bag of charcoal is being sold or by one of our members and getting a pretty good price for it. I've forgotten just how much he sells it for, but it's wholesale. And then other ways of bagging your charcoal. I took a class on making biochar, another thing that you can do from your forest. Uh, that little bag just down further is a bag of charcoal and that sells for about $3. Okay, and over to your right artist, are a number of things that we collected from a group of, uh, well, that is, that happens to be um, Douglas fir tea. It happens that the true firs and Douglas fir, you can take the needles, dry them, and make tea out of them, and it's wonderful. Um, okay, and then off to your right a little further, we have a number of items that came from Ukraine, and this happens to be a uh, a sachet, a bag of items for sachet. And then down further, there are a number of things that make teas. And then further on that brochure shows a uh, brochure. This lady is selling birch uh, sap as a drink in Ukraine. So that's enough for now. But what I wanted you to see was that these are just items that come from the woods and um, you can indeed um, sell things from your woods. Okay, now I want to go to the next item here. All right, let's see, what do I need, Glenn, here? Glenn, you want to go back to the slideshow. So if you started from the beginning, you're right there, go over to the left. Okay. Uh, it says from beginning. Start video. Yeah, start okay. video. Thank you. And then go to your slideshow from the beginning over on the okay. upper left corner. Got it. All right. And you should be able to use the, there we up, go. the up arrow or down arrow to, to just advance the slides. Yeah. Okay. So there I've you given go. you some a few pictures to continue this, this idea of giving you ideas for what you might produce from your woods. This is the um, 
bottle of Douglas fir oil that we're selling in five milliliter form. And uh, we are selling this to the new season stores. Uh, here's the premium firewood. It's nine by nine by 16 inches, and this happens to be uh, hardwood. Um, you can gather mushrooms and sell them, but as Glenn says, you'd want to sell the ammonitis. Um, truffle harvesting, it's a kick to go out and watch the dogs work. One of our members actually won first place. Her dog was the best dog in truffle hunting in a, in a contest recently. Um, another thing you can do with a portable sawmill. Um, actually, our family cut some KMX pine and ponderosa pine, and Ben Doimling converted it to uh, fire to 5% uh, moisture content, and then he had it tongue and grooved for us. And we made we built a floor in our daughter's house with ponderosa pine. You could do a native plant nursery. You could tap big leaf maple trees. Um, we have quite a business in the co-op of selling holiday boughs. Here's a 10 pound bundle of noble fir. Um, to reinforce uh, what you can do with uh, wood turners, this is a very expensive burl on a maple tree. And uh, you probably have seen several like this. It's amazing for what that could sell for eventually. Um, maple burl cross section. Wood turners love this kind of thing. Uh, here's what you can make from a maple jewelry box. And Miles Merwin, one of our members, is selling these uh, and selling other items that members have produced. Okay, now let's go on to talk about an inventory. One of the items that Glenn has made available to you is a property inventory. And I'd like you to, to look that over. Most of us don't really know for sure what we have on our forest land. And if you go through that uh, inventory that we've made available to you, You'll see that there are sections on hardwoods and softwoods, a section on edible berries, edible mushrooms, items, plants that are medicinal, um, floral greens that you might have. And then when you look at the inventory carefully, you'll see that it's not complete. You need to complete it. And you can complete it by looking at how to inventory what you have as a family. For instance, tools and equipment, chainsaws, tractors, splitters, uh, computers, uh, printers. What are your personal skills? Include that in your inventory and add to it. And as you're doing this inventory, think about some of these things. Um, how much do you have in terms of florals or medicinal plants? Um, what volumes do you have? How much? Um, for instance, when you do a simple marketing, can you sell your stumpage? Can you watch for markets of opportunity? Do you have secondary um, manufacturing and marketing capabilities? Is it worth it? Those are all things to think about. Recently, uh, and in, for the last couple of years, I've been talking about agroforestry as a means of some way that you could add value to your property. So think about what is meant by wildcrafting. Does your inventory include your location and your accessibility? And then think about how you spend your time on your farm. If you think about thinning, for instance, Normally, most of us would thin our acreage starting at the, about the time when we realize that 300 trees per acre is too much. And so we start cutting out the two tops, the trees that aren't growing straight, those that have died. Well, what can you do with that rather than just let it sit on the, on the ground and rot? Not that you shouldn't do that, but it's a good idea. 
but when you thin, you're spending some of your valuable time. So what could you do in addition to spending that time? You could actually bundle firewood and sell it. And so you'd add to the time you normally spend, but you get some value out of it as a result. Okay, let's talk about marketing at this point. How can you make a buck and not lose your shirt? Um, when you choose a product, you want to think in terms of your woodworking skills, for instance, your hobbies, what you like to do, what turns you on and so on. And of course, keeping an idea of what equipment you have to do this. And it might be carvings, it might be truffles, it might be something like that. But you want to consider the marketplace. You want to consider these things. Um, when you are concerned about the buyer, the buyer has certain ideas in mind and they're not as sophisticated as you are, but more than likely, the ideas of clean air, clean water, improving the environment are important to them. And people do buy on emotion. So you want to get into their shoes and you have to think about uh, what is being sold in the marketplace. And an example, um, one of my members and I went into a new season's market and we asked the market manager, do you mind if we ask customers some questions? And he said, no, go right ahead, no problem. So as people came in, we asked them, would you like to visit a tree farm? And if you visited that tree farm, what would you expect to see? And how much would you be willing to pay for half a day in a tree farm? And um, would you expect a lunch? Uh, would you expect transportation? What are the kinds of things you'd want to know? Well, from our discussion with our uh, stores, we found out that people would be willing to spend $60 for half a day, and they'd expect a light lunch, perhaps, and they would expect to know more about the forest when they left than when they got there, and they would expect to have a very delightful clean experience. Well, if you rented a small bus, a 14 passenger bus, and you put 10 people on it at $60 for half a day, that could uh, come out to a pretty good price. So that's one of the kinds of things you need to do if you ever decide you wanted to sell something from your woods. Um, when you develop a product, we recommend that you do what you do best. Focus on what you do best. Don't try to do a lot of things at one time. And uh, don't try to start something that you don't know how to do. Learn how to do it first. And be sure that you invest your time in investigating the product. Do some due diligence and find out the answers to these questions. Here's how we bundle our firewood. That happens to be Lyle Pirenton. And those bundles I showed you were made by him. We, we use this twister machine. Some of our people do as much as 20 bundles an hour. And if you sell a bundle for three or $4, uh, pretty soon you're selling a cord for around $600 wholesale. And this is one of the things that we are doing as a co-op, uh, selling bundled firewood. This happens to be the super split that most of us have purchased, and it happens to have an ergonomic handle on it, which is sold separately. But we use a super split because it can make very small pieces. And when you bundle firewood, if you look back here, you want to be sure the thing is nice and tight and completed, not just any holes in it, because people don't like to buy something that isn't what you know, a full three quarters of a cubic foot. So this is the way we do it. 
Lyle also happens to own a wood miser sawmill. And he cut those ponderosa pine and KMX pine logs that Ben Doylem dried and turned into flooring for uh, our daughter's house. And he did it with this wood miser. Um, your due diligence is you need to gather the numbers. You do need to count your time, although I don't count the time that I would normally use to thin, for instance. And the things you normally would do, I don't count that time because I do it anyway. But anything beyond that, I do count that time. And count your time at current market value. How much does it, would you get paid if you were doing this for somebody else? Um, the cost of your raw materials, the transportation, how much your gas and electricity costs you. And if you're doing marketing, how much does it cost you to get a brand, for instance? And do consider carefully how much all of these cost you before you decide to go. And the reason I mention this is that I have a friend who's an incredibly good wood turner and wood worker. He bought a laser machine for $50,000. And he did that without thinking about what he would make with it, at least not very much. And he basically went broke. He didn't find anything that would pay for his machine. He made some wonderful things, but he never sold enough to pay for that $50,000 machine and everything else he invested in it. So my point is, be careful. Don't invest in something before you know that you've got a very good chance of making something once you start in and making your income to pay for what you do. We've found that there are three things that you need to think about particularly when you sell something. We've found that uh, quality and service and price are what people look for. And believe it or not, price is the least of these. If you have high quality and very good service, you won't have to have, you won't have to have the lowest price. And for instance, our competition in the firewood business is selling their bundles for almost half of what we're selling for. And the reason that we're selling so well is that we spend a lot of time being concerned about the quality. We want to make sure that our wood is dry, that it's clean, that it's uh, very well packaged, and that it stacks well so that some kid won't come along and pull a bundle down on his head. Um, we want to have the best quality. And so far, we're ahead of our, our market in many ways. And for the last uh, three years, we sold $130,000. Last year is almost $150,000. And we're ahead of that this year. And that's with only 12 people working. And those 12 people shared 91.5% uh, of that number. Uh, we give back to our members 91.5% uh, of our firewood. It's a different percentage on bows, a different percentage on each product. But the idea is we're working to deliver the money back to the people who do the work. So a perceived high quality is enhanced by good service. That is, um, for the firewood as an example, uh, in, on Sunday night, our firewood coordinator calls every one of the people who's making firewood, finds out how much uh, firewood they have bundled during the week, how much they're ready to sell, and then calls the stores the next day, and the stores tell, give the coordinator their orders, and then our coordinator 
disperses the orders to the members depending on how much they have produced. And we then deliver that order within two days of the time the order is received. So that means that the store doesn't have to order a week or two ahead of time from a distributor and hope the distributor brings what they have ordered. They know that we're going to deliver on time as much as they've asked for. And so again, high quality, good service, price is secondary. Okay, design a brand. And um, we did pay for this. Uh, it cost us to get this brand. And uh, you'll remember when artists showed you that canopy brand that we use for the essential oils. That also was one that we used. But you can find a good designer for a brand. So don't hesitate to have a brand designed. A brand makes a big difference in terms of being able to sell. If you just have a label that shows what you're selling in big black letters, it's not nearly as attractive as something like this. So do think about it. Where can you get help? The Service Corps of Retired Professional is excellent. Uh, they put on weekly um, lessons that you can take online just like this on different things, how to, how to market things through the internet, how to sell things overseas, how to uh, do a lot of the things that a small businessman needs to do. So I recommend SCORE as a possibility. Um, use the internet. Find some, if you don't know how to use the internet, find a young person who does and ask them to help you find what you'd like to sell on the internet and see if they're selling it. Uh, Etsy is one of the uh, ways people are selling things that they're making themselves. So E-T-S-E-Y, I think it is. Just click on Etsy and find out what people are selling. Of course, the community college classes are wonderful. There are good ways to learn from, from there. And the family, close friends' opinions are important. Don't discount it. Um, Woodland organizations, OSWA, OSU Extension, definitely. Tree School, uh, OWC can help you. And don't hesitate if you have a few bucks to hire a designer and hire a marketer or find somebody you know who does designing and marketing. It's worth your while. And then build community. Find people that can work with you. Uh, here's uh, on the right-hand side, here we are working in the snow before Christmas time, gathering Christmas boughs or holiday boughs. And last year we sold over $7,000 of boughs. And again, we did service. We took the orders early in the week and made sure the florist had them in their hands before the end of the week. That way we had the very freshest material that wasn't sold through a wholesale house that got dry by the time the florist had it. It was fresh. On the left, um, we are doing a uh, yearly session on how to bundle firewood. We make it open to anybody that wants to learn and we teach people how to bundle firewood. And you can see the super split there and the twister that we use to, for the bundling. So work together, uh, find people that have the same kind of interests that you do and don't hesitate to find other people to help you. So your story is important. And you'd be surprised at how much the market really is interested in forest health and how the health of the forest improves the health of the population. Build your story to reflect those values. Um, we, I mentioned earlier when our firewood people, when they sell a bundle of firewood on the back of their label is the story about their tree farm. 
And it just amazed me because I've had customers call me and say they've actually collected a few of our labels and because of the stories that are on the back. It's, it's just a heck of a kick to know that they are doing that sort of thing. So it's been a lot of fun uh, just being involved this way. So join the Oregon Woodland Cooperative. I, we recommend it. Uh, there's some advantages if you do. So that's my full presentation. Let's go back to Glenn now and see if we have some questions. Okay, thank you, Neil. And we are open for questions now. I guess since you've got that slide up right now, before we launch into that, before I forget, then uh, just a plug for the, the next Tree School online webinars. Uh, next week, next Tuesday, uh, we've got Introduction to Small Woodland Management on July 14th uh, at the 10 o'clock, and then Managing for Beneficial Understore Vegetation uh, is the three o'clock uh, a week from today. Um, so with that, I will go to the questions. Uh, we'll just have a couple right now. So please, uh, if you've got more questions, put them up for us. Um, here's one about, talk about the harvesting of a variety of forest products from state, federal, private lands, permissions and permitting and what's required or not um, for, uh, you know, harvesting uh, products from other lands. Well, it's really important to do that. Uh, you know, truffles are becoming more and more valuable. Um, uh, Dr. Lefevre had said at one time that there are properties within the Willamette Valley that could produce $5,000 per acre per year in truffles alone. Well, if that's the case, you don't want somebody coming in and stealing your truffles. Uh, so you might want to pay the landowner for the right to go and uh, search for truffles on that land. So I think for any time that you're collecting something on private land, you should get permission from the landowner. And then as far as the uh, state is concerned, state and federal lands, definitely you should go to the offices of uh, Oregon Board of Forestry and uh, get permission to uh, go on to those properties. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can collect and it's, it's certainly a good idea. Yeah, certainly if you're talking about going to others' property, you need to know whose property and uh, know what the permissions and the permits that might Well, be not only that, but one of the other problems is that there are truffle hunters who use a large toothed rake that actually destroys the roots of the trees that they're, they're searching for truffles under. And so damage occurs, and that's really a concern. Uh, yeah, Charles spoke about that this morning. And in the old days, people, people use forks uh, to look for truffles, and there's a couple of problems. One is that it, you get um, unripe truffles along with the ripe ones. And right. So the dogs are far superior for just getting the ripe ones. Oh, first. much better to use the dog. Uh, as well as all the disturbance to the roots and the forest floor. Right. Um, here's another question. Uh, talk about constructive ways to deal with neighbors, uh, both corporate or family forest owner neighbors, who may not be the best practitioners uh, of woodland management. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they're getting at there, but uh, certainly in your woodland art community, the co-op, you know, getting along with neighbors and maybe different ideas about uh, best practices and uh, constructive communication? Boy, that's a real tough question. Uh, there are so many personalities out there that uh, it takes a psychologist sometimes to figure out a way to approach some people. And my approach has always been, if I feel I can benefit that person in some way, that's the way to approach them. Uh, if you tell them that when you leave, the woods will be in better shape than when you got there, and that you're going to help them to improve their own land, you'll find that you're much more accepted than if you say, I want to go hunt on your land. Um, you know, you have to be careful how you approach people. And I don't have a quick answer for you. It's, uh, 
every everyone's different and everyone approaches things differently and receives things differently too so it's a tough one well at least within the woodland owner community some like the membership organizations the oregon small woodlands association um, yes. the local chapter uh, just promoting good conversation and gatherings and communication is, is very helpful but not everyone's a joiner for those kinds of things right um, if you're not in an area with a new season store, uh, how would one market products like the firewood bu bundles? How do maybe the bigger question, you know, how do you find markets or um, away from uh, Portland area new seasons pipeline that the Woodland Co-op has? Well, um, I think that the fact that you are local, that if you go to, suppose you live in the North Bend area or, or uh, Coos Bay area, if you, you know, it's mostly grocery stores, buy marts, uh, hardware stores, that sort of place that sells firewood. And I would go to the owners and tell them that you're a local landowner, that you are trying to improve the uh, forest, and that in improving the forest and working locally, you're adding value to the community and you'd like to uh, approach them about selling your firewood bundle. And boy, that's, that's a key to, to be, tell them that you're local and that it's not going to hurt the forest and that it's going to actually improve it uh, is a big sales item. Uh, we've found, well, recently we just picked up several more stores that are very happy to work with us. I think the story is the key that, that comes through in a lot of different ways is that story of from the family forest from the woodland uh, to the local community. Uh, I was thinking, how did you get new seasons to just let you come interrogate their customers? And I bet you the story you told uh, is what convinced them that that would be okay. Oh, absolutely. The fact that we're local, that uh, we are interested in what they're doing. And if you walk into a new season store, it'll give you an idea of what you should do. Because if you look on most new season stores walls, there are things like organic, you know, words like organic, uh, local, um, family owned, um, you know, the words that are very personal, very much uh, healthy oriented. And those are the kinds of words you want to use when you approach somebody else. It works. Well, here's a business question. Um, someone's asking about uh, trying to create a livelihood. Uh, and uh, what do you think about the form of the cooperative or LLC or what, what kind of business uh, structures um, do you, are you experienced with or do you have any, any advice? Well, legally, the cooperative is not, let's say, a legal cooperative. We are a C corporation but we are cooperative in the sense that volunteer members are at the, on the board and volunteer members are helping the rest of the members to find ways to add value. And uh, for instance, um, I guess to be a true cooperative, we would have to share any profit with all of the members. Well, what we're doing is sharing profit. Actually, we're not sharing any profit at this point because we're not making a whole lot because we're giving 91% back. And But what we are doing is the person who earns the dollars gets 91.5% of it. So that's the way we are cooperating. We're, we're helping each others um, to we're showing them how to make a buck, and then we are uh, making sure they get the buck as a result of our marketing and sales coordination. So it's really just a matter of how you set it up and your kind of rules of the road, even within a, a regular corporation, you can set Correct. up to be a cooperative. Yeah. There's yeah. probably some other um, structures that are used around the country or the world too that we could right. look into. With, with our, our cooperative, the only person that we are actually paying anything to other than a cooperative member is our accountant and our accountant works on a contract basis and we do pay that accountant 
to uh, make sure that all of the books are straight and that everyone gets paid on time. Here's a question. What should I consider before harvesting selected timber for my small acreage, uh, forester or logger? Uh, kind of a more general uh, woodland owner um, advice here about considering harvesting from small acreage. Well, that goes back to ask your OSU uh, extension agent who they should talk to and talk to your neighbors. Find out if they have done any logging recently or any harvesting and get this is again get to that neighbor this is a good time to get to know your neighbor if they've done something in terms of harvesting because they'll be happy to talk about what they've done and more than likely allow you to get on your land uh, when you start talking about them and getting their story you'll find out that your story becomes important to them too but uh, use those professionals that i mentioned earlier Find out who, who's the best one. It happens that as a cooperative, as our um, organization, we do have some preferred providers, and we would be happy to share that with you if you join our organization. Yeah, I mean, as your OSU Extension Forester, I definitely like to help people kind of consider what do I need to know uh, to hire a, a good contractor and Absolutely. one of the key things is start by talking to your neighbors or people you see that have had work done uh, or join the uh, the woodland co-op or the small woodlands association chapter in your county and talk to the members and learn what they can tell you uh, i can't actually recommend a good forester or a good logger i have to always give someone a list and give them ways to screen that list but getting good information from people who've had the work done is really the best if you can do that right um, very good. Uh, here's another question about specifically taking out 30 pine trees killed by Ips beetles along with some healthy pine that are near those trees. Uh, is there a problem selling firewood from such trees? Um, we think that Ips beetle has moved in, moved out, uh, moved in and out. Uh, so maybe not a problem. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how question. to answer that. Um, uh, you'll find that if you, you dry it, thoroughly, the beetles will leave. Um, we do kiln drive our, ours, and there's a temperature which no bugs can live. Um, Lyle Purinton, who I showed you his picture with the uh, uh, wood miser firewood, and he was doing the bundling, he actually built a kiln, and he heats a lot of the wood that he sells, and there are no bugs in it as a result. So that is a problem. Yeah, uh, and so in terms of the Ips beetle, you know, knowing that you have pine and you have Ips, and that tunes us into the what's the biology of that particular beetle. Uh, right. Every tree species has its own bark beetles, and some behave differently. Uh, if the tree has been dead for a long time, uh, it went well at least a year usually, and if the needles are brown or dropped off, then the beetles have come and gone once the trees are dead and dried out. Um, or if you can dry it out, as Neil said, the firewood uh, or kiln drying the lumber. Um, but generally, if the trees have been dead for a while, uh, those tree killers have moved out. There's other bugs in there, but they're not going to be a threat. Uh, but the green trees that are next to the ones that were killed, those might be full of beetles. And that would certainly be a case where you'd want to make sure those are, um, are split and dried before you would move those around. Uh, I mean, there's a general rule. You don't like to move firewood um, very far from where it came from and for fear of spreading invasive pests so right. that's something we can consult more call call sure. your extension forester for more details if you like exactly and uh could you discuss your essential oils a bit more and, you know what kinds you're making in the process um kind yeah. of the costs and the setup right um that's been a fun activity um we have a mentor his name is Robert Seidel, and he owns a company called The Essential Oil Company. And you can go online and, and find out what he sells. He happens to travel the world looking for new oils and helping people to distill from many of the plants around the world. And of course, everybody knows that lavender is an essential oil, and it's probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular. But what we did was take his advice and uh, learn how to distill oil from our trees. 
And what we're doing is um, we go to a local Christmas tree farm that's overgrown. Instead of being eight feet tall, the trees are 20 feet tall. Well, you can't sell a 20 foot Christmas tree very easily anymore. And we cut down three trees and then we take off only the greenery from those trees. And once we take that uh, greenery off, we, we chip it, we run it through a chipper. And in running it through that chipper, uh, it, the only reason we do that is so that when we put it in our still, it's compacted. And the still holds about 200 pounds of greenery. Well, the still is ju works just like a still that makes whiskey. Uh, it has a little different orifice on it and a little different exit on it. And, uh, but you heat it up to uh, the point where the water is boiling and the steam is created. The steam comes out the top and it goes through a, a, a coil that cools the, the steam to condense it. And then it happens that the oil that's in the steam is lighter than the water. And so when it comes out the end, the oil floats on top and you have a device that separates the oil off the top and uh, you can bottle it. And uh, from that 200 pounds of greenery, we get about 16 ounces on the average of oil. Pine happens to go a lot less. Um, Western red cedar happens to produce quite a bit more, but average is about 16 ounces of oil. And then from that 16 ounces, we sell five milliliter bottles. So each ounce produces about six five milliliter bottles. So it gives you an idea how many five milliliter bottles we get out of a single batch of oil. And uh, it's been fun to do. But in doing that, if you think about it, another way is that you just limb a tree up. Well, if you're taking the lower limbs off of a tree, you're actually improving the future growth of that tree because all of the wood from there on is going to be clear. And so if you start limbing up the tree, you'll have clear wood from then on and you've improved your forest and improved the wood that you might eventually sell and you've gained something by trimming your trees. Um, it's a neat way to go. It's been fun to do. So how much does a little vial, how much does a vial of Douglas fir essential oil sell for? We sell one five milliliter bottle for $8 wholesale. And what kind of volume are, are you selling a lot of that these days? Right now we're not selling much at all because of the COVID-19 uh, <laughs> thing. People are spending their essential money on something else. And Not this essential. is probably considered a non-essential. We are selling online, by the way. And, <clears throat> and we're doing much better online than we are by new seasons for the, at the moment. So how does one join the co-op? What does it cost? Oh, go online and go to Oregon Woodland Co-op. And uh, the cost is $50 per year. So we'd love to have you join. All right, that answers that question. Um, here's a more uh, maybe difficult question. Um, is there such a thing as an organic forest um, in terms of like organic certification, I guess, and uh, the need for pesticides, chemicals, et cetera, kind of how that plays into, um, you know, the, the forest and the, the story behind the forest? I think that technically, most forests could not be considered organic simply because most of us, after a clear cut, use an herbicide to uh, hold down the new growth of the brush until the trees get up to where they're free to grow. And for that, that reason alone, I guess you could say a forest is not organic. But when you think about the forest growing for 70 years and there was only one year of herbicide, uh, you could argue with the question, I'm sure. Yeah, and that uh, does go along with some of the other 
uh, approaches. I mean, there are some landowners that work very hard to use no chemicals, no herbicides, yeah. no pesticides, and they do a lot of work by hand. Uh, so certainly one can choose to manage, you know, in different ways. Uh, but as far as the certification goes, um, the kinds of certification available for forests and forestry, um, there are several. The main one for woodland owners is the American Tree Farm System, which certifies uh, woodlands. Um, and it doesn't necessarily contain, you know, any organic label. It does not. Um, but it's a certification that gives people information about the story behind the tree farm. The uh, another one is the Forest Stewardship Council is another certification program that uh, has a lot of best practices and it has policies about pesticides, etc. So that's probably the closest thing you come to that, uh, you know, some kind of certification for forestry and many woodland owners are managing in a way that's, you know, very um, uh, obviously diligent and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, personal, you know, passion and management that goes behind it. You know, I was thinking uh, that, that there's oh, there's another question. Good. I was going to come up with one of my own. Um, is there a way for an artisan to contact a woodland owner directly for products that they didn't know they had? For example, native plant roots, uh, plants or roots or parts that can be used to make dyes um, that, that the woodland owner saw no value in. So I think the artisan says, here's something I think is valuable and they want to contact woodland owners to let you know, hey, there's another product out there that you may have that you didn't even know about. Oh, we're always open to new ideas and uh, we can always find the expert that knows the answer um, because we have so many resources at our fingertips right now. But uh, gosh, if you know of a product, let us know, we'll, we'll work with you. I'd say contact the Oregon Woodland Cooperative, look online for that, for that contact. Um, yes. As, and you could also contact the chapters of the Oregon Small Woodlands Association. You can find them online as well. And I'm sure they'd be happy to, to know about your ideas. Oh, absolutely. Okay, um, another question popped up, keep them coming. Is there a tree school class for small woodland owners exploring opening their forest to green burial options? Hmm. Well, that's maybe a question for me. To what, to I, what I, kind of options, Glenn? Green burial. So this is putting someone to rest in the forest. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. I certainly haven't come up with a tree school class for that. And I'm not <laughs> sure of the, you know, what the ins and outs of the, um, what's involved in that uh, in terms of le legality or the kinds of agreements. I know that there are woodland owners who do bury their own family members in their uh, in their forest. Yes, I, um, that's for sure. And so there. And I happen to know a fellow who has an airplane and a business of spreading ashes from the airplane, but uh, I just don't know of the specific green burial concept. I think with proper agreements and permissions, uh, it could be done other than on your own land. But uh, yeah. I know we've had inquiries about that at our Hopkins demonstration forest uh, owned by the nonprofit Forest Forever. Um, and we've decided not to um, have that um, as far as that kind of thing. Sure. So, um, very good. Uh, oh, here's one. Um, there was one uh, website that somebody put in the Q&A, uh, local uh, greenburialcouncil.org. So that's something um, okay. there. That might Obviously, be a, it's uh, something people source. are thinking about. Yeah. So I was going to ask, since we've got some more time, um, I know one of the original goals of the, the Woodland Co-op, and generally for all of us trying to help each other in family forestry, is just getting a leg up and having the safety in numbers or the power of the cooperative to negotiate and to uh, make sure that you get good quality service, the contractors and the contracts and the things are done properly and best practices are followed and that, you know, the, the right price, the right cost. So um, the co-op's been active in that. And uh, what's the status of just helping folks uh, make a better deal with, uh, you know, their woodland management services and selling products, you know, timber or otherwise? Well, Barney Donine and George Schroeder felt that by having 20 or more members representing 10,000 acres or more, that the mills would give a better price if we were part of the woodland cooperative. And 
we also found that uh, the loggers would be more willing to work for us because if they uh, found that they worked for one member and they did a good job, the next member would call them also. And that has happened. Uh, they've gotten better prices and they've been able to negotiate because they are a Woodland member. Um, and, and same is true of just being an Oswa member. Um, the opportunity to negotiate when you have an organization behind you definitely helps. If you're on your own and you have only five acres, you're not going to do very well. But if you belong to an organization that does a lot of this, you will be able to get a better price and uh, get a better price for your logs and a lower price for, for harvesting them. So it's well worth joining some group that can help you do this. Very good. And um, that reminds me, we have a, our last Tree School online class. So this uh, series um, is going to be a kind of wisdom uh, from the woods. So several panelists who are very experienced woodland owners who want to share, you know, what they've learned over the years. Uh, so uh, along with the Woodland Co-op, there's the uh, uh, the wisdom from the woods, uh, the last tree school class with the panel that we're going to have on July 28th. Um, and speaking of uh, being more attractive to loggers, if there's any loggers in the audience here, I just wanted to remind folks that you can get uh, continuing education credits as a pro logger for the Associated Oregon Loggers. Anybody out there looking for that you can uh, find the form on the resources on the knowyourforest.org, the tree school online site there, and drill down to find this talk. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't see any more questions in the queue. Uh, we still have a bit of time left. Um, I recall you you told the story about the pine floor that you put uh, built oh, yes. from trees that were planted and that whole process of just making the most of the goods from your woods, even if you're not making a lot of money from it, uh, just making use of uh, interesting products from the woods. So well, that was one example. Um, if you want to, are there any of the stories like that that you can think of? Or just uh, well, it's a personal story that I enjoy telling. But and if you talk to some of our other members, you'll get similar stories. But um, in 1951, my parents bought a house in Sherwood with 10 acres, and the 10 acres was a former turnip field and blackcap field. Well, my dad, being a forester, uh, decided he ought to have trees on it. And so he wrote to all of the uh, forest experiment stations and asked them to share any seedlings that they wouldn't be planting. And he would get packages uh, that would have, you know, pin oak in them, packages that might have eastern chestnut. Well, what he did was heal them into the garden. If they made it through the winter, he planted them on the 10 acres. Well, I helped plant those trees. My sister helped plant those trees. My brother helped plant those trees. And our neighbors helped plant those trees. And um, it became a forest. We have harvested probably 20 loads of logs off of that 10 acres. And it's still a, a beautiful forest. And our daughter happens to own it now. But what he planted some of those trees, of course, have no market in the sawmills in Oregon, or very little. He planted western, uh, he planted Willamette Valley uh, ponderosa pine, he planted KMX pine, but he also trimmed those trees as they grew. And so many of those trees had clear wood from the time they were six inches in diameter to the time they were 20 inches in diameter. And um, we couldn't sell the logs when we did our first harvest. So um, we had a logger put the logs on the ground. And then Lyle Purinton came over with his, West, his uh, wood miser sawmill. And we cut the, the trees, in, the logs into um, one inch lumber of varying widths and stacked it and sticked it and dried it and put it in a barn. Well, a few years ago, our daughter bought my parents' old property from the LLC, 
And um, she said, Dad, what do you want to do with that pine that's in the barn? And I said, I don't have any use for it right now. And she said, I want it. And I said, well, it's yours. So she said, I want to put a floor in our house. She happens to be very interested in Victorian architecture and Victorian houses. And her house is somewhat a Victorian design. And in her research, she found that the early Victorian houses in the United States were, they built wood floors, but they built oak floors if they had money on both the up, upstairs and the downstairs. If they didn't have a lot of money, those people did oak, oak floors downstairs and pine floors upstairs. So she got it in her head that she wanted a pine floor in the upstairs of her Victorian home. Well, Lyle um, and I then took that lumber down to Ben Doimling. Ben ran it through his kiln, took it down to five to 10% moisture content. And then Ben took it over to Trillium Lumber in Hubbard. And uh, Trillium Lumber did the planing and tongue and groove work, and then brought it back to the house we stacked it inside the house so that it acclimated to the temperature and humidity in the house. And then the four of us, Artis and I and Lori and Jim Marsh, put that floor down and then we hired a floor finisher. And it's gorgeous. It's just a beautiful KMX Ponderosa pine floor. And it, you know, when, when pine lies on the ground for a while, it gets a blue fungus in it, and it has a blue stain on it. Well, we think it's beautiful. And if anybody wants some pictures, I'd be happy to send them the photos of the floor. Uh, we're very proud of it. It looks wonderful. I would love to hear that story again. And that actually reminds me, somewhat related to Goods from the Woods, um, our group that focuses on using local trees and local wood. It definitely uh, is the, is. the Build Local Alliance, uh, which is something that uh, we're promoting as well. So that's sure. another story. But uh, for those of you interested in that, um, go out and look for the Build Local Alliance about taking local trees and making local products. Um, let's see, there's one more question. Somebody is just commenting that Mr. Schroeder should consider a storytelling podcast on a regular basis. <laughs> delightful to listen to you and young people would be enlightened by your stories. So oh, thank I'm you. Just sharing that comment. Uh, there was another comment that, that they just thought this was a great presentation and I do too, Neil. With that in mind, I'm going to put up the, the closing poll um, and see if another question comes in while I wait. Um, okay. And we just want to know um, what you thought of the presentation. So if you have a chance, answer the questions on the, the, the poll. Um, and then I see another, no, there's not another question. So um, I'm just gonna let folks take some time with the poll and certainly you all know where to find Neil. Uh, been a regular at Tree School. I wanna thank you for trying the online version. It was a little bit of a trick to, to employ help from artists to show us things that are you normally would have brought into the room and, and let people look at more hands-on. Uh, well, so and don't forget the smell of vision Glenn. We have not figured out how to transmit the smell of the essential oils over the internet, but oh. imagine someday that will happen. Um, that, that's kind of frightening, perhaps. But uh, uh, And you know where to reach Neil through the Oregon Woodland Co-op or also the uh, Washington County Small Woodland Association and through me. So I think with that, I'm just going to let folks answer the exit poll here. And with that, Thank you for being brave, Neil, and employing uh, technology and making it work to share online. My and pleasure. Hopefully, hopefully we can do it in person, but in the meantime, thanks for doing it this way. Well, with that, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna end the show. And thank you all for coming. And Neil, thank you and Artis very much. Thank you, Glenn, much appreciated. You're welcome and goodbye everyone. Bye-bye.